Okay, so last time we uh, finished the first chapter, which was about GPS. And I think by now um, you should have a, a pretty good understanding of uh, generally how the course works. So uh, we start with um, very basic, um, um, basically description of the principle of operation of a given sensor type. Then from there we start from basically close to scratch uh, physics principles. We develop uh, um, how on a physics level uh, the system, the sensor works. And then from there we build up to a full system level uh, analysis and understanding of uh, the sensor. So this is uh, going to be basically uh, the flow of the course uh, moving forward. Uh, every chapter we pick a new type of the sensor and basically go very deep in it. Um, so we finished GPS, chapter two is inertial sensors, then we are going to talk about uh, ultrasonic sensors, radar, lidar, and finally cameras. Okay, uh, before we start inertial sensors, I also uh, want to say something very important, which is uh, most of the core concepts that we develop and talk about regarding uh, different kinds of sensors, um, you should uh, um, kind of uh, take them as concepts that can go beyond just the sensor that we are talking about. And those concepts could be very useful in other types of applications. So very concretely, for instance, uh, in the context of GPS, we introduced this idea of uh, ranging codes and doing time of flight measurements using the, these pseudo-random uh, noise sequences. Now this concept, of course, it's, it's, it was introduced as part of the, how the GPS works, uh, but uh, you can think of it being used in many other types of sensing, right? So anywhere that you want to measure basically a distance from a time of flight, uh, you can use uh, the idea of M sequences or pseudo-random noise uh, sequences with the correlations and everything that we uh, talked about. So uh, same concept, for instance, uh, uh, if you modulate a laser light with those sequences, you can imagine that maybe you can make a LIDAR with it. Or if you modulate millimeter waves with it, um, um, maybe you can make a radar with it. If you modulate sound waves with these uh, ranging sequences, maybe you can make a good ultrasonic sensor with it. And those are exactly, uh, throughout the course, you would see that we'll come back to these core ideas. So again, as we talk about things, uh, don't tie them just to the um, specific application and the system that we're talking about. Think about these as general ideas uh, um, that, that can be used in other contexts and for uh, design of other systems. Okay, with that, any questions about GPS before um, we start chapter two? No? All right. So let's just start talking about uh, inertial sensors. Um, so uh, when we talked about navigation, uh, we said that uh, essentially you need uh, three things to do uh, good navigation. You need mapping, um, you need localization, and you need odometry, right? Now, a GPS specifically, for instance, is a sensor that uh, uh, helps us a lot with localization and also provides some limited odometry uh, so you can get your velocity basically out of the GPS signals. Now, when it comes to um, localization, uh, there is uh, two main types of localization techniques. One is called position fixing, which is exactly what the GPS does. So basically you receive some signals or beacons um, uh, from external transmitters, and using those signals by some processing, you're able to fix your position or localize yourself. So that's uh, position fixing is, is, for instance, what the GPS does. Uh, then the second type of technique, it's called dead reckoning. And dead reckoning is basically um, um, you localize yourself using odometry. Uh, so you start from, uh, say, a, a known position. You know where you are right now. And if you know your velocity, um, um, so you know uh, in what direction you're moving, by what speed, you can uh, basically, in small time steps, uh, deduce your delta in position, how much your position is going to change, and by just integrating that over time, you can build up a trajectory of your movement and continuously localize yourself. So that's the idea of dead reckoning. And um, 
Uh, these two techniques, dead reckoning and uh, position fixing, um, in most systems uh, that uh, need to uh, navigate in complex ex environments, uh, they do both of them because uh, in, in many ways they are uh, complementary to each other as, as, as we'll see. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail of why exactly they're complementary right now. We'll get back to this towards the end of this chapter after we've learned how dead reckoning works because we don't exactly know how um, uh, what all the details of dead reckoning. Um, but uh, what's important to note now is that inertial sensors, uh, which are also referred to as inertial measurement units or IMUs, are uh, one of the key enabling technologies for uh, dead reckoning um, uh, localization and, and navigation. Um, so uh, with uh, the way dead reckoning works is that, uh, say you have some robot uh, that's moving on some trajectory, and uh, at each point in time, if you, from your odometry, you get the velocity vector of the robot uh, relative to some uh, global external frame of reference. So in this picture, we are taking, say, the geographical north direction as our uh, global um, reference frame. And uh, the velocity vector basically tells you in what direction and by what amount you would move with respect to your global reference frame in each time step. So you can basically integrate that, start from some initial position at time t1, and then integrate your velocity from t1 to t2, uh, and that gives you the position at, at time t2. So you basically, if you continuously integrate, uh, you can do your dead reckoning that way. Uh, if you don't have continuous functions, you can discretize this and do kind of like a discrete integration over time. Okay, so um, when it so so dead reckoning requires odometry, right? You need to know know your velocity, and there's different ways of uh, uh, doing odometry. Simplest one is called the contact odometry. So um, that's basically by measuring motion uh, uh, by via direct contact to uh, reference uh, frame or reference surface. So that's, for instance, how cars do odometry. They basically count the number of rotations of the tire on the road, and that's how uh, the car tells you the speed that uh, you're, you're moving at. Um, then we have visual odometry. Uh, visual odometry basically uses uh, images, either 2D or 3D images, from a camera or from a radar or from a LIDAR. And then from these images, or uh, a series of images, which uh, you can think of as frames of a video, for instance, uh, from those, frame by frame, it uh, extracts some uh, uh, basically uh, visual features, these are typically geometrical features like corners of certain objects and, and other things. And then um, by doing some math, it basically tracks how these features are changing frame by frame. And from there, you can deduce uh, basically um, odometry uh, or how, how, the, uh, um, um, how you were moving. And the third one, uh, which we will talk in a lot of detail in this chapter, is inertial odometry. And in inertial odometry, you basically start by uh, measuring acceleration, not velocity directly, um, from some uh, forces that are applied uh, to your sensors. You uh, measure acceleration. And then if you uh, integrate acceleration, you get velocity. And then you can integrate your velocity to do uh, dead reckoning. So um, how are these three types of odometries related? Contact odometry um, um, is, is, uh, can be very accurate, but it's not always possible, right? You, you might not have uh, a surface contact that, that, that uh, lets you measure uh, velocity. For instance, when an airplane that's flying or a drone that's flying, you, you cannot make contact to any reference surface for that. Uh, so that's the limitation of contact odometry. Visual odometry can be very, very accurate. But it has two issues. One is that it's uh, computationally expensive. You need to do uh, complex uh, uh, computer vision algorithm to extract features from uh, 2D or uh, 3D uh, um, um, frames of data, and then kind of do additional math on that to, to do odometry. Uh, the other limitation of it is that it can, it can or it usually is, pretty slow. Um, because uh, the sensors that give you images, for instance, if it's a camera, typically runs at about 30 frames a second. If it's a radar or a LIDAR, things can be at 10 frames a second. So you don't get your odometry updates very frequently. 
And inertial odometry, um, it also has uh, its pros and cons. It can be very fast, so you can get update rates of up to a few hundreds of hertz, up to a kilohertz or so, which is very fast. Um, um, but because we don't directly measure velocity, we start from acceleration, and then you need to integrate that to get to velocity, uh, biases and other noises get into the integration and can make it a little uh, inaccurate. But still, inertial odometry is extremely, extremely useful, and some systems, in fact, can entirely run on uh, inertial odometry and, and, and perform very, very well. Okay? So, um, let's start with uh, uh, the principle of inertia, which is kind of like the underlying physics principle of how IMUs work. And basically, this principle says, if you have any object, it will continue moving at uh, its, its current velocity until a force is applied to it, which causes the speed or the, the direction of the, of the object to change, okay? So from this, uh, we basically can conclude that uh, uh, it, it's really the forces that uh, we need to measure that then can tell us something about the acceleration and ultimately the velocity of, of the object, right? Because if there's no force, there's no change in the movement of the object, which means there's nothing we can measure inertially, right? So specifically, there is two types of motion uh, in, 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 in objects that uh, uh, are tied to specific forces that are applied. First, we have linear motion, and uh, this is um, possibly one of the most uh, basic uh, things that, that are taught in physics classes, which is basically uh, uh, Newton's law of motion, which says force equals mass times acceleration, and your acceleration is the second derivative of uh, position with respect to time. So F equals M P double dot, and the double dot means the second derivative. It's a more compact notation for uh, the second derivative. Okay, so that's linear motion. This should be very familiar. Then we can have uh, rotational motion. And it's a slightly more complicated. So when it comes to rotational motion, there are three forces that can cause rotational motion. Uh, uh, the first two are called the centrifugal and Coriolis forces. And those are proportional to the angular velocity, or omega, of an object. And then there's what is called the Euler force, which is proportional to the angular acceleration of the object. If you have not heard of these forces, centrifugal, Coriolis, Euler forces at all, no worries. We will develop them from, from first principles, so, so you do not need any prior knowledge about these. Uh, but if you have heard of them, I think it's still going to be very interesting because you will see how we can use them to build sensors. Okay. So um, with this, um, Let's just start with, like, what is the simplest um, inertial sensor one can build? It turns out it's a bucket of water. Uh, that's the very simplest inertial sensor you can have. And uh, we can just make a simple thought experiment called the Newton's bucket experiment. And uh, we kind of understand how it works. So if you have a bucket half filled with water, and uh, the signal you get out of this sensor is you just observe the surface of the water in this bucket, and let's see what we can measure from that, okay? If, there, if, the, if the bucket is at rest, it's not moving at all, of course there's no signal, right? You get a perfectly level uh, water surface. Also, if it's moving but at a constant velocity, as we know, if there's no linear acceleration, still the surface of the water would be uh, perfectly level. So uh, uh, position or location and velocity we cannot measure. Uh, with this inertial sensor, or in fact with any inertial sensor. But as soon as you start accelerating it linearly, uh, the, the, the water surface becomes slanted like this, and that gives you a signal that is somehow related or correlated to linear acceleration. So that kind of tells us that this inertial sensor, somehow uh, with it we can measure uh, linear acceleration. Okay. What about rotation? It turns out that uh, rotational motion, you can also measure it uh, as soon as you start rotating this bucket uh, about its uh, axis, the surface of the water starts becoming kind of like a bowl, which is also a very unique shape, which gives us a signal which we can use to um, basically um, um, indirectly measure rotational motion. Okay, so this kind of uh, a very simple thought experiment uh, tells us the kinds of things that we can and cannot measure 
uh, um, inertially. Okay. Of course, this is not, not a useful sensor. Uh, we'll talk about useful ones, but it's, it's a starting point to kind of see like how these forces are related to the quantities uh, we are interested in, in measuring. So with this, um, there are two very distinct types of uh, inertial sensors that we will talk about. Uh, first is uh, accelerometers, and, and these, as the name suggests, uh, the, the, they measure uh, linear acceleration, or A. And then uh, there's gyroscopes, which measure angular velocity, omega. And these operate on uh, different but closely related physics principles, as, as we'll see. So first we'll spend some time, um, basically today, uh, we'll talk about accelerometers, and then next time uh, we'll, we'll talk about gyroscopes. Okay, so um, let's, let's talk about some technologies that can enable us uh, basically build an accelerometer. There's different kinds of technologies, but at the core of them, uh, there's what we call a motion transduction mechanism. And what a motion transduction mechanism is, it basically is a mechanism that uh, transforms a external force that you apply to the sensor into a quantifiable signal. Okay, and we'll see like what the quantifiable signal is and how we actually quantify it. But the mechanism, so if, if you apply a force, you need to somehow uh, extract a measurable signal out of it because as we just said, acceleration is in, in linear motion, it's, it's proportional to force. So if you can get a quantifiable signal out of a force that is applied, then hopefully you can, with some simple transformation, get acceleration out of it, okay? So what are different types of motion transduction mechanisms? Uh, there's many different uh, 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 technologies that can enable this, and this list is not um, comprehensive, but it captures the most uh, common ones. So you can have uh, mechanical uh, uh, systems that do this for you. Uh, it can be optical, um, your motion transduction using some optical phenomena, you can actually uh, 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 um, get a quantifiable optical signal out of forces. It could be based on surface acoustic waves or it can be based on fluids or, or, or fluids, fluid mechanics. Now the most common one, uh, which uh, also is the most, uh, for most applications is the most um, accurate uh, uh, technology to work with is mechanical. And that's the one that we will um, talk in great detail about. Um, so mechanical accelerometers almost in every robotic application, uh, the, the uh, accelerometers that are used are based on uh, mechanical motion transduction. And uh, these days, these are typically fabricated using MEMS or microelectromechanical uh, machining technologies, and uh, we'll see some examples of that. Okay, so how do you do motion transduction mechanically? It's actually uh, very, very simple, the architecture. It's just a damped uh, spring mass system or a damped harmonic oscillator, so you have some mass and uh, uh, you um, basically have a spring and a dampener inside an enclosure. And the enclosure is typically basically your uh, silicon chip uh, that, that becomes the sensor ultimately. Um, so the spring mass system or the damped harmonic oscillator has three components. There's of course the mass uh, of some quantity M. Uh, it's called proof mass typically. Um, so that's just something that uh, uh, moves and generates some uh, Newtonian force. Then there's a spring with some constant K, and the spring basically couples forces that are applied to the enclosure of your uh, sensor to the mass. Okay, so that's how you couple force. And then you have uh, some damping mechanism with a damping factor B. And the, the reason you need the damping is that without any damping applied, uh, as you apply a force and couple it to a mass with a spring, uh, depending on like this specific waveform of the force applied, uh, you can have behaviors like resonances or overshoots which are not desired for sensing. So the damping mechanism basically uh, controls the dynamics of this mass and make it a little uh, uh, basically uh, better behaved for, for the sensing applications. 
OK, so here's a very simple diagram uh, of a mechanical one-dimensional accelerometer. So this system is only going to measure acceleration applied, say, in, in x-axis here, uh, horizontally. OK, so we have the enclosure here. Again, this could be uh, a, a, the silicon chip. There is some external force applied. And due to that force, this entire enclosure is going to accelerate, right? Um, linearly. And that is the acceleration we want to measure, or the sensor will measure. So the sensor will measure the acceleration of its uh, full enclosure, right? Now, internal to the sensor, as we said, there is a, a damped harmonic oscillator. So you have your spring with constant K, uh, with some uh, uh, connected to some mass, and then you have some damping mechanism. Here, I'm showing it as a kind of like a dash pot, but uh, um, as, as, as we'll see, this is, this is not how it's physically built. There is um, other ways of uh, basically adding dampening to the, to the spring mass system. Um, but what's important here, so we're going to study the dynamics of this system. So again, as, 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 uh, as usual, we need to um, um, make sure our, uh, for, for every quantity we are going to talk about, which in this case, for instance, is the displacement of this mass is the uh, key quantity we'll talk about, uh, we need to specify in what frame of reference that is measured. Okay, So here we, are, we have two, two frames of references. One is the external one, which is kind of your, your global or your world coordinates. right? Um, and in, in this coordinate, say your, your enclosure, the box, has some position we call x sub b. B for box, right? So, so that's in the world coordinates. Then you go inside our enclosure, internal to that, you can have another uh, reference frame fixed to the box. And relative to that, your mass can have some displacement, which we call x. OK, so x is the displacement of the max, ma uh, proof mass relative to the enclosure, and x sub b is the position of the enclosure in the world coordinates. OK, so then um, what is the position of the mass in the world coordinates? If you call that x tilde, it would be x plus xb, right? So xb is where the box is relative to the uh, reference point of the external coordinates. And then you add the internal displacement of the mass to it. So x plus xb is x tilde, which is the position of the proof mass relative to the external reference frame. It's very, very important. Um, uh, to keep track and always clarify what different frames of references is. And here we're starting simple. As we go throughout this chapter, you would see it becomes uh, more, more, more important and a little more complex to keep track of our frames of references, especially when we start introducing rotational motion. Then things uh, become a little more complicated, not too complicated, but uh, just Kind of like train yourselves to always track and define your frames of references very clearly. OK? Any questions so far? All right, let's continue. So what we are going to do now is we are going to basically see in this simple uh, uh, mechanical setup, uh, how is the displacement of the proof mass related to the acceleration of the enclosure. And if there is some simple relationship between the two, that can define basically a mapping or a transfer function that goes from external acceleration to the displacement of the proof mass. And then if we invert that function, basically we can calculate acceleration from x. Okay, We have not yet talked about, OK, how do we actually measure x? That, will, that is going to come later. For now, we're just going to establish at the physics level, are these two quantities even related in an um, in interesting way, useful way or not? OK, so that's, we are still at the physics level. OK, so let's talk about accelerometer physics. So the total force that the proof mass experiences is the sum of two components, the total inertial force. There is the force of the spring, and there is the force of the damping system. Right. So your inertial force applied to the proof mass m is the sum of the spring force plus the damping force. So let's build a very simple uh, model of what these forces are. So what is the inertial force applied to the mass? That's just Newton's law, right? So that's mass 
times acceleration. And the acceleration of the proof mass is x tilde double dot. Why x tilde? Because this is the force in the global reference frame, right? That's we are talking in the, in the world uh, um, coordinates. That's the acceleration of the, the proof mass. So m x tilde double dot. What is the force applied uh, by the spring? If we plug in the very simplest physics model of a spring uh, using Hooke's law, it's linear uh, and it's the, the, the spring constant times the displacement or uh, um, the displacement of the, of the spring internal to the box. So the uh, force of the spring is minus kx. What is the dampening force? Again, there's different models. We're going to go with the simplest one, which is linear dampening, and that's your dampening factor times the uh, velocity of the, the proof mass. And again, this is the velocity internal to the box, right? Uh, that's why this one is x dot, because it matters in, internally how fast it's moving relative to the enclosure, and that determines how much dampening force it's, is applied to it. OK, so we have these uh, three quantities defined. Let's plug them into our uh, uh, force equation up above. And also remember that we have x tilde, which is the position of the mass in the external reference frame, is equal to x plus xb. Uh, xb was the position of the box in the global frame, and x was just the displacement of the mass internal to the box. So we plug those in, and we get m times x double dot plus xb double dot equals minus kx minus b x dot, OK? Now, um, the key thing to note is that xb double dot, the second derivative of xb, is the acceleration of the enclosure, right? Because xb was the position of the enclosure in the, in the global reference frame. So the second derivative of that is the external acceleration applied to the enclosure, which is exactly what we want our sensor to measure, right? So we are looking to measure this a external, which is xp double dot. OK, so let's. Uh, um, plug that in there, and then with a simple rearrangement of the, of the equation, this is what we get. We get a second order uh, linear differential equation uh, which relates x to a external, right? So it's x double dot plus b over mx dot plus k over mx equals negative a external. So now we are onto something, right? So now we have uh, basically gotten this um, linear dynamics equation that relates the displacement of the proof mass internal to the box, right, relative to the enclosure, to the external acceleration that is, that is applied. OK? Very good. So next step is to see if we can solve this differential equation and directly, because here we have like the x and its first derivative and its second derivative. It's, it's interesting, but still not useful for, for sensing and measurement. So if you can solve this and directly find the relationship between x and a, then uh, we, we can claim that we are onto something really useful for, for sensing. OK, so let's try to solve our uh, linear dynamics equation. Um, there's different ways of solving it. The one I, I like is using uh, Fourier transform. So um, from the concept of Fourier transforms, we know that uh, any specific force applied, uh, which is a function of, of time, any waveform, uh, force waveform that you apply, f external of t, you can basically decompose it using the, the concept of Fourier transform into a bunch of complex exponentials. So you can write it as a summation or an integral of a bunch of terms, which are each of which is some f0 times e to the j omega t. OK, that's just the concept of Fourier transforms. And because it's a summation and because the, the uh, 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 differential equation we are trying to solve is linear, uh, we just need to find a solution for one of these complex exponentials. And then using the superposition principle, we can basically sum the solutions up for, for different terms and come up with a more, more general solution. So let's, let's uh, start focusing on just a very simple harmonic force applied to our accelerometer and see if we can solve the dynamics equations for that. So um, knowing that force and acceleration are linearly dependent, so f is just m times a, uh, we know that if our f is a simple harmonic term, acceleration is also going to be some a0 times e to the j omega t, right? That's just from Newton's law, basically. 
Okay, another thing we know is from our knowledge of uh, 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 linear dynamical systems uh, or linear uh, differential equations, we know that if the input uh, is a pure harmonic to the system, knowing that it's a linear system, the output is also going to be a simple harmonic function of the same frequency. So if your a is a0 e to the j omega t, your x of t is also going to be some x0 e to the j omega t. That's just by the linearity of, of, of the system. Okay, so we plug things in, this, this function for a and this function for x, we plug them into the differential equation we had, we take the derivatives of x and some common terms factor out, and then we are left with this, which is x0 times k over m minus omega squared plus j b omega over m times e to the j omega t equals minus a0 e to the j omega t. Okay, now things are getting really, really interesting. Uh, the e to the j omega t's kind of cancel out from both sides, and then we are left with a direct relationship between x0 and a0, which is given by this. So x0 is this term. Don't mind what it is, okay? It's, it's some stuff, but it's some, something which is only a function of omega um, times a0, right? And uh, what's and what is x0? x0 is the amplitude of motion of the, or the displacement of the proof mass. And a0 is the amplitude of the acceleration, this harmonic acceleration that's being applied. And these two are directly uh, um, um, proportional to each other. And uh, what is the uh, proportionality constant, it's minus one over, to simplify the notation, we have introduced this new variable omega zero, which is the square root of k over m. So that's related to the mass and the, and the spring constant in this way. And then it's uh, minus one over omega zero squared minus omega squared plus b, uh, uh, jb omega over m. Okay, so now we have something actionable and, and useful. And basically the key uh, um, um, conclusion that we've come to is that the displacement of the proof mass, x of t, is proportional to the acceleration that is applied. So now we are onto something uh, useful and actionable because if we can somehow measure x of t, then using this transformation, we can find a from it. Does that make sense? Okay, so now we're, we're, we're building something useful. Again, started from very, very simple principles, but we already, after a little bit of uh, math and physics, we are onto something uh, useful. Okay, um, one side note here. So you might ask, okay, um, uh, when we were doing this, we said that our, our acceleration is a0 e to the j omega t and also this function that we have found for x is a complex function, but these are physical quantities, so like a displacement cannot be complex. It's, it has to be real valued physically. So is there a disconnect here, or did we cheat, or, 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 or what happened? And we did not cheat. It's actually a very common practice in, in, in uh, physics and, uh, and, and other engineering fields that uh, to, to simplify the math, we work with complex valued functions, these complex exponentials. But the physical quantities tied to each of these functions are actually just the real, val uh, real parts of, of, of these functions. So for instance, the physical value of acceleration is the real part of this a0 e to the j omega t, or the physical displacement of the proof mass, the quantity that you would actually physically measure, is just the real part of that complex function. But we use complex functions because it makes the math a lot easier to track, like things like derivatives or cross terms, instead of having to work with sines and cosines and things like that, it's just a lot easier to work with uh, these uh, complex exponentials. That's the only reason, okay? You could do all this working with physical quantities. So you could start with your force being some F0 times cosine omega t. Uh, Actually, we did that in the last chapter for GPS, and I did it deliberately, so it, you, if you go uh, remind yourselves of what the math looked like in the GPS, it was a lot of cross terms, cosine squared, cosine times sine, and things like that. But uh, you could do basically the same thing with uh, a much more concise and elegant math uh, if you use this idea of complex exponentials, okay? And we use both of these. Uh, again, I, I want you to be comfortable with both types of 
uh, um, 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 parametrizations or formulations of these functions. So throughout the course, you would see sometimes I use uh, complex exponentials, sometimes I use actual uh, signs and cosines as, as, as physical quantities. And it's, it's, it's a very deliberate. Uh, uh, it's not to make things inconsistent. I actually want you to be comfortable to work with uh, both of these representations. OK, so with that, now we have um, a very direct relationship between uh, displacement and, and acceleration, right? And uh, we can actually derive what is called a transfer function now for this, uh, for, for this system. So the transfer function is uh, basically uh, exactly the, 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 the relationship between our x and a. So if I go two slides back, and uh, let's actually write this on the board. Um, so we found that our x0, the amplitude of the displacement, is minus 1 over, uh, what is it, omega squared, is it plus omega 0 squared, minus jb omega over m, something like that, or plus, oh, that's a minus, this is a plus, okay minus plus times a0, right? So from this, if uh, we look at the ratio of, of, of x to a, the displacement to the uh, acceleration applied, that's what we call a transfer function. So h of omega, the transfer function, is x0 over a, or a0, which is um, exactly this term, minus 1, omega squared minus omega 0 squared plus j b omega over m. Okay, so that's our uh, TF, or transfer function. Um, and uh, uh, normally to study like the, the, the uh, high level um, behavior of the system or input-output relationship of the system, this is a complex valued function. It's very common to look at its amplitude uh, and, and, and phase separately, especially the amplitude of this function basically tells you um, is the system, for instance, as a, a, an acceleration is applied for different frequencies, which is omega is the frequency of the applied acceleration. If you look at the amplitude of this guy, um, is it flat across frequency? Is it going to go up and down? Like, is, does it amplify? Does it attenuate? Or does it just scale and, and um, pass through the signal? So uh, looking at the amplitude of the transfer function as a function of frequency is uh, very insightful in terms of, of what to expect from this system. So if we take the amplitude of uh, h of omega, that's just this function, 1 over the square root of, of, of this term, and it's a function of omega. If you have a studied uh, electric circuits or maybe uh, some uh, uh, dynamical systems, this might be familiar to you as the transfer, standard transfer function of a second order low pass filter. If you have not seen this, not a problem. Let's plot it and see what it looks like, right? So we can now plot this uh, amplitude of h as a function of omega, uh, the input frequency, and this is what it looks like. There's three curves here. I'm, I'm going to talk uh, about like what, what the differences are. But before that, note that uh, this is uh, a log-log plot, plot. Both the x-axis and the y-axis are logarithmic. And also, uh, they're normalized. So the x-axis, instead of uh, just plotting versus frequency, we're, we're plotting versus normalized frequency, which is omega over this omega 0 that, that we had defined. Okay? Um, that's just one thing to note. And, and we did this so uh, uh, we can basically have one plot that kind of captures all different types of systems. Now, high level, uh, as you see, at low frequencies, we have a pretty flat response, OK, which is a, a very desired behavior, because this means that uh, for, for inputs uh, whose frequency are much lower than omega 0, so when omega over omega 0 is a small, like 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 1, and so on, uh, the amplitude response is constant, which means what the system does, what uh, this transfer function does, is just a scaling, right? Your output x is just proportional to a with uh, a scale factor that is, depend uh, that is determined by h. There's no frequency dependent variations, okay? And then if you look at very high frequencies, like above uh, omega over omega 0 equals to 1, around this part of the plot, you see that all of them, 
start going down. And that's why it's a low pass filter, right? So inputs of very high frequencies are going to get filtered out or significantly attenuated. Uh, inputs that are low frequency, they're just going to go scaled. And then there is kind of like your, your uh, 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 cutoff frequency, as we call it. And different types of behaviors can happen around this frequency, which is omega equal to omega zero, right? That's, that's your 10 to the zero uh, vertical line. And the to different types of behavior that can happen, they uh, are uh, strictly determined by how much damping you have in your system. Uh, first, let's look at the red curve, which kind of peaks around here. And when it peaks, it means that for uh, some frequencies that are uh, close to omega zero, your filter is going to start amplifying them, right? So you get like a larger uh, amplitude response from your filter. And that's called an underdamp uh, system. And underdamping happens when uh, the value of the damping factor B is less than 2 square root of m times k. Okay. Now, the smaller the B is, this peak is going to become larger and larger and larger. And in the case that your B is 0, you can actually have uh, an undamped system, which can basically in theory, it can blow up and give you like an infinite response. Uh, but in practice, we always have some amount of damping. Um, um, so, so this never becomes really infinity, but it can peak pretty high. That is an undesired behavior, right? You don't want these uh, uh, resonances or, or, or very uh, large amplitude oscillations to happen in your system. You want something that has a very nice flat response, right? Um, and then if you look at the yellow curve, uh, which is an overdamp system. So that happens when your value of B is very large, uh, specifically larger than 2 root uh, m times k. Uh, it's OK. It's flat. It doesn't resonate or anything. But you're kind of eating into the bandwidth of the system. So if you think of it as a low-pass filter, as you increase your damping factor, this cutoff frequency, which is where your basically the knee of the curve is, starts becoming lower and lower and lower. And that's also not a desired uh, behavior, because why eat into the bandwidth of the system? That means uh, higher frequency inputs are not going to generate a response that we can measure. Okay? We want as, as, as large a bandwidth as, as, as we can have, typically, without instabilities and things like that. So kind of the sweet spot between the overdamped and underdamped is what we call the critically damped system. And uh, that's when B is exactly equal to 2 root M times k. And for those systems, the cutoff frequency is exactly, uh, uh, the, the 3dB uh, cutoff frequency is exactly equal to omega 0. Okay? And that's kind of a, um, usually it's a, it's a desired type of behavior for a system to be, to be critically, critically damped. Okay? Does this make sense, the frequency response and uh, how these different types of behaviors can, can happen in the, in the mechanical system? Okay. Uh, so when you have an input whose frequency is much, much lower than the bandwidth of your system, which as we just saw is generally speaking determined by this omega zero, that's a bandwidth again, uh, this was omega equals omega zero line. So generally speaking, that's kind of roughly determines the bandwidth of your system. If your inputs are much lower in frequency than that, uh, then we have a very, very simple relationship between displacement and acceleration, uh, which let's actually look at it here together. Um, so, so, so this top expression is the general, this is always correct, right? Whatever omega is, you have this relationship between x0 and a0. But if you look at omegas that are much smaller than omega0, right? So if you make the assumption that omega is much, much less than omega 0, then what happens, the approximation you can make here is, uh, OK, so, so this term is negligible compared to omega uh, 0. Uh, and, and this term is also negligible, right? Anything that has omega in it is, is, is negligible. And then you basically just get a, 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 a linear relationship between your x0 and a, which is minus 1 over omega 0 squared. And remember, omega 0 was square root of k over m. So this is also equal to, in terms of the, the proof mass and the, da, uh, and the spring uh, uh, constant, it's minus m over k a0. Okay? So when inputs are well within the bandwidth 
of the system, you get a very simple, just a scaled uh, factor relationship, direct proportionality between displacement and applied acceleration. Okay. Now this factor here, this number, is called the sensitivity of our accelerometer because it basically tells you um, for a given acceleration how much displacement you're going to uh, um, have inside the accelerometer and that's the, that's the sensitivity. Now by looking at this expression, of course we want a large sensitivity, right? We want as large a response as possible for a given acceleration so we have a large signal uh, to measure. Uh, now by looking at this, naturally uh, you might think, okay, so to have a um, large uh, 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 sensitivity uh, we should increase M. We should have a big hefty proof mass uh, to give us uh, good sensitivity. While mathematically it makes sense, uh, in, in practice, that's not the case. Because in practice, uh, for the application for which you're designing the sensor, that application is going to kind of require or dictate what bandwidth your sensor needs to have, right? So it's say whatever avionics application, and you know that the, your inputs are going to be up to 500 hertz of vibrations or whatever, and you need to measure those types of accelerations. So that kind of sets what omega zero is going to be for that application. And once you fix your omega zero, then, then, then you cannot touch M or K, or the, the, the ratio needs to be constant. So it's actually the omega zero that determines uh, your sensitivity. It's the bandwidth of the system, right? So that's for a very practical, practical reason. Uh, one, one example here, so for instance, let's say you are designing an accelerometer for an airbag application, okay? So uh, an airbag accelerometer, it needs to respond very quickly, right? As soon as there's impact, it needs to be able to, to respond to it. So a typical response time, and again, these are some just typical ballpark numbers I've, I've thrown in there. A typical response time, say it's a quarter of a millisecond. So then that means the bandwidth you require from your accelerometer is roughly speaking one over your response time, so one over tau, which is four kilohertz, okay? And from that bandwidth, you just found your omega zero, which is two pi times f, uh, so two pi times uh, 4,000 radians per second. And once this, this is set, that means your, um, your sensitivity is also set, okay? So practically speaking, um, um, it's, it's, you, don't, you don't determine your sensitivity by proof mass, or you don't improve it by adding proof mass, because you have a requirement for your omega zero. Okay, for this reason, um, uh, it's practically speaking, you can, we can say that the sensitivity is actually independent of the proof mass. It's, it's just set by the bandwidth. And uh, because of this, the, the modern accelerometers, they actually have very, very small proof masses. They are in the microgram range in terms of the mass, uh, which, is, which is very, very small. That's for a very practical reason. Any questions so far? Okay, let's continue. So we talked about uh, an input which was uh, just a, a, a simple harmonic, right? Just uh, one of these, yes, question. Uh, so the mass is a microgram. Mm -hmm. How would the mass of the spring or the damper contribute to that at all? Wouldn't that be significant in relation to the mass of the, of the actual mass? Yeah. yeah, so the question is if the actual proof mass is just micrograms, uh, then uh, you also need to account for the, 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 the spring itself would have some mass and the, and the damping system. The damping system will come back to it actually the way it's practically implemented, it's, it has no contribution to the mass. Uh, the spring you're right, but as we talk about, uh, hopefully today we'll get to a point where we can talk about how these sensors are actually manufactured, you would see that uh, for instance, in these MEMS processes, um, the way they're done, the spring is negligible mass compared to the proof mass. Uh, so if this guy is in micrograms, the spring is like a fraction of a microgram or less in a way that it, it actually uh, still, it's dominated by the mass of the, the proof mass itself. Okay, so um, uh, Next thing to talk about is basically, um, so, so we talked about 
a, a, a simple harmonic input, right? So if, if you just have some a0 e to the j omega t, we solved our, our, our uh, uh, differential equation for that and, and found the solution. But in general, your inputs are not simple harmonics. It can be any, any waveform, right? Some a, a, a external of t is applied and we need to find the response, which is the displacement. Uh, but it turns out that, again, if we go back to the principle of the, of the Fourier transform and use this transfer function we have derived, h of, 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 of omega, uh, with this, you can uh, basically use this h of omega and find the response to any input. So if you have some input a of t, function of time, the way you would uh, find the response is first you take the Fourier transform of a, so take it to the frequency domain, multiply it by the transfer function, h of omega, and then take the inverse Fourier transform of that. And that would be equal to your x of t. So that's how you do it for a general input. Simple as that. All you need to know is really this, this transfer function that we found using the simple, simple harmonic input. Uh, so with that, again, we can look at different types of inputs. Uh, one that is particularly interesting is a step input. So if you have an input that A of t that is zero for negative times, and then at time zero, it suddenly jumps to some value A zero, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a step input, and let's see how the system responds to that. Uh, the response is a very dependent, again, on the damping factor of the system. Okay, so again, the system, uh, x of t, it's at rest at zero, and then at time, zero, that's where you apply your step, right? And then that's where x starts changing, right? For, let's look at the overdamp system. So when you have overdamping, the response is very, very slow, okay? And it's gonna take the system a very long time to get to what we call the steady state. And the steady state is what you expect. It's just the sensitivity times a zero. Right, so your steady state response is again minus one over omega zero squared times uh, a zero. Okay, but then you have this transient between uh, where you were at rest and the steady state response, and the transient takes some time to basically settle, and then you get to the steady state response. What we really are interested in for sensing is the steady state response. Right, the transients we, we want them to actually die off pretty quickly because we can use the steady state response to find A0, right? The transients are kind of uh, not interesting for sensing. Then if you have the, the red curve, which is an underdamped system, uh, it, can, it can do some oscillations, uh, right? Um, it can ring a little bit and then uh, get to a steady state. Here I'm, I'm drawing kind of like an exaggerated underdamped system, so they don't all um, oscillate this much. So you can have something like, for instance, just a slight bit of undershoot and then get to steady state. So this green can also be a, a less underdamped system. Okay, and then the blue is your, uh, is your critically, uh, critically damped, which uh, it doesn't overshoot or uh, it also doesn't take a long time. It kind of um, settles down in a, in a kind of like an exponential type, um, type response. Okay, so those are different types of uh, uh, responses you can uh, you can uh, expect. Uh, the key point is that, as you saw, all of them, given enough time, settle to the same steady state response. Overdamp, un underdamp, critically damp, they all get to the same steady state response, which we call x uh, sub steady state, and that's just the sensitivity times, times a, a zero. Okay, so ultimately, you can kind of sort of argue that you could use either of them for sensing, but if you want a sensor that does not do uh, uh, um, like a, 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 an unstable oscillations and also does not take a very long time to respond or to settle to steady state, you would want to design it to be either critically damped or slightly underdamped. Um, and in practice, all accelerometers that are made are, are designed to be either critically damped or slightly underdamped. And by slightly underdamped, that's the one that I drew which can over or undershoot just a little bit, uh, but then it, it, it settles to steady state very quickly, okay? Um, another thing to note is um, why the negative sign here? Why is that our displacement kind of like we apply a, a, a positive, say, acceleration and we get a negative displacement? Um, intuitively, that's the same effect like, say, when you're in a car and you accelerate quickly, you get pulled back, right? So then in that case, you're the proof mass, the car body 
is the enclosure of the inertial sensor and, and, and your movement is basically that displacement that you're sensing. So car is accelerating forward, you feel like you're getting pulled backward and that's exactly where this negative, negative sign is, is, is coming from. Okay, so uh, we talked about physics. Uh, there's one more thing to talk uh, about before we, we close, uh, close on the physics and that's a, a, a very subtle point about non-contact forces. So uh, it's very important to note that the type of accelerometer we have been describing, these uh, mechanical accelerometers, can only uh, measure n uh, contact forces. These are also uh, called uh, specific forces. Um, you can have non-contact forces of, uh, acting on these uh, accelerometers, but they're not measurable. So a very interesting thought experiment is that, imagine you take one of these accelerometers and then let it start from rest and drop it and let it free fall in some gravitational field. And let's see if it can measure actually that gravitational force that is acting on it. So we start at rest, our x of t is zero. x dot, the velocity of the proof mass is also zero. We are starting at uh, perfect stationary. And then it's gonna free fall in a gravitational field. So gravity is gonna accelerate everything, right? The enclosure, the proof mass, the spring, everything is gonna uh, experience the same gravitational force. So x tilde double dot is of course equal to g. So g is say the, 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 the uh, um, um, gravitational acceleration of Earth is g, 9.8 uh, meters per second squared. So x tilde double dot, that's the proof mass's acceleration is g. The body or the enclosure is also experiencing the exact same acceleration as they're free falling. So that means x, x double dot, which is the acceleration of the proof mass relative to the enclosure, which is x tilde double dot minus xp double dot is zero, right? So that means putting everything together, if we start at xt equals zero and the initial velocity is zero and the initial acceleration is also zero, that means there's not going to be any displacement for this proof mass for as long as it's free falling in, in, in the gravitational field. So x of t is gonna be zero for all t, which means we will get no signal. Remember, x of t is the signal that we get out of the accelerometer. We'll get no signal due to this gravitational force that's, that's being applied on it. Um, so non-contact forces are not measurable. Important thing to note, I did not say accelerometer cannot measure gravity. I did not say that, right? If it's gravity through contact, it can. So say there's an accelerometer in your phone, you put it down on the desk, and now it's experiencing gravitational force through the contact with the, with the desk surface, right? Because now there is a counter force applied from, from the desk equal to negative g to the accelerometer on this thing. And then you, it does measure a minus g uh, acceleration actually through that contact. But if I drop my phone, I'm not gonna do it, but as it's free falling, it cannot measure what the gravitational force is. Okay, this is very important, especially for certain types of applications in space and things like that. It's important to know uh, that non-contact forces are not, not measurable. Okay, any questions? All right, so uh, let's continue. Now we want to uh, develop a system level architecture. We talked about, we started from the mechanical architecture of our accelerometer and now we're gonna extend it to the system level. And specifically for a system architecture, what we have not done yet is talk about how do we actually measure the displacement of the proof mass, right? Because that's the signal that is directly proportional to acceleration and we need to measure that. Before we talk about how, let's understand order of magnitude wise what type of signals we're dealing with in terms of the displacement of the proof mass, okay? So let's say there's an acceleration of 0.1 g Again, g is 9.8 uh, uh, meters per second squared. There's an acceleration of 0.1 g applied to an accelerometer. And our accelerometer has a 10 kilohertz bandwidth. This is, the bandwidth is kind of high, but not outrageously high. Uh, some uh, accelerometers have less bandwidth than this, but let's just work with that number. So we plug in the numbers into the equation we have for x0 and a0. So x0 is minus a0 over omega0 squared. You plug in the numbers and your x0 turns out to be a quarter of a nanometer, okay? So we are talking about extremely, extremely small displacements 
for some applications, especially if you, have, if you need to have a, a large bandwidth and you need to measure small uh, accelerations, then it translates to very small uh, uh, displacements. Uh, and, and that's a challenge to solve. So you need to design electronics sensitive enough to be able to pick up nanometer scale or even sub-nanometer scale displacements. Okay. And there are several uh, technologies that uh, have been successfully deployed for measuring these kinds of uh, um, displacements. There's piezoresistive technologies. The piezoresistive basically uh, 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 translates a mechanical stress to a change in electrical resistance. And then there's a circuitry that measures that change in resistance. Uh, um, and, and that's how it's done. Then there's piezoelectric uh, uh, methods, which again translates a mechanical stress to a change in electrical charge. And then you measure the charge. And uh, that's how you get your displacement. And finally, there's capacitive uh, sensors. And these basically translate displacement to a change in capacitance. And then if you can measure that capacitance, that is basically the signal you want. Uh, the capacitive sensing uh, is, is the most common technique and also gives the best performance in terms of, uh, sense, uh, in terms of uh, noise and SNR. Uh, that's the one we are going to talk about. Okay, so now the objective is how do we um, take this displacement of the proof mass and design something that translates that to a change in uh, capacitance that we can then electrically measure. The concept is very simple. So again, we have our uh, same mechanical architecture, proof mass damped uh, uh, with the, with the, with the uh, spring and, uh, and damping mechanism. And what, what we are going to do is we are going to add a, a, a capacitor. Assume it's just a parallel plate capacitor with two fixed electrodes. So those are these two. And then you also apply a fixed voltage to them. So you apply a voltage V0 to your first uh, fixed plate. And then the second one, uh, you can just ground it or, or apply a, a different voltage to it. Okay, so you apply a known fixed for now, voltage to a parallel plate capacitor. And then you add a third plate, which is tied to your proof mass, and then that one can move inside the fixed capacitor, right? So with doing that, we essentially are generating two variable capacitances, one between the first plate and your middle plate. So that's the first one, and then that is the second one. So call them C1 and C2. Right? So these two capacitances, as your proof mass moves, are going to change. Right? And because of the change in those capacitances, uh, the electrode that is tied to the proof mass is going to have different voltages according to where it is inside the fixed capacitor. Right? Because the, the ratio of the two capacitances, C1 and C2, is going to determine the voltage of your moving plate. Okay. Now, um, um, it turns out that the, 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 the math is actually extremely simple. The voltage, uh, call that V sub x, of this moving um, capacitor plate is a linear function of, of displacement. Okay, because it's, it's just a, it becomes a linear voltage divider, basically, uh, according to the position or the displacement of the center plate. And uh, here's the equation. So the, your Vx, which is the voltage of, of the, the, the moving uh, uh, electrode, is a V0 over 2 times 1 plus 2x over d. x is your displacement, and d is the total uh, separation between the two fixed plates. Of the, of, of the outer capacitor. Um, so uh, just to see that this makes sense, we can plug in some numbers together and uh, check it. So let's just start with when x is 0, uh, that's at, at rest, right? There's no displacement. And then let's say we've designed it such that at x0, x equals 0, your uh, moving plate is exactly in the middle of the, of the outer capacitor. So if you plug in x equals 0, this becomes vx equals uh, v0 over 2. Okay, which kind of makes sense. You have a fixed voltage zero with a uniform electric field between the two plates, and then you put this third plate right in the middle, you get half the voltage, right? Uh, if you plug in x equals, let's try one more, um, one of the two end limits, so d over two. So that's where you're touching one of, essentially touching one of the, the two capacitors. You've displaced by half the, uh, half the spacing. So if you plug that in, then your Vx, becomes equal to V0, 
which makes sense. You're touching one of the end plates, so the, the voltage you pick up is exactly equal to the voltage of that plate. If you plug in x equals minus d over 2, you get vx equals 0, which again makes sense. So, so this is just essentially a linear voltage divider. Okay? And now this is also interesting because we have uh, we've basically with the simple linear transformation, uh, we are uh, going from displacement to a voltage that can be electrically measured. Okay, and that's exactly how it's constructed. So with this, we can now basically sketch a full system level diagram of what a accelerometer architecture looks like. Okay, so let's uh, walk through this uh, together. So this is our capacitive sensor. Again, you have your fixed plates, and this middle one is the moving plate, which is tied to the proof mass. I'm not showing the proof mass here because this is kind of like an electrical architecture diagram, but note that this is tied or uh, connected physically to the proof mass. Now, what we do, uh, instead of applying a fixed DC voltage, we actually apply the modulated voltage with some uh, uh, modulation frequency omega c, right? And again, this is, uh, this is uh, always common practice, as we also uh, saw in the case of the GPS, uh, as much possible, especially when you're working with small signals, low uh, SNR signals, uh, you want to move them away from DC as much possible. The DC part of the spectrum, there's always more, more noise in it. There's one over F noise, there's other type of noise that kind of pollute the, the, the low frequency parts of the, the spectrum. So all this cosine omega CT is doing is basically just modulating our signal away from DC uh, so we get less noise and interference coupling to it. Okay, so then uh, we have X of T and then the voltage that this plate picks up is the same expression we had, V0 over 2 times 1 plus 2X over D modulated by the same carrier frequency, uh, cosine omega CT. And then after you pick that up, um, uh, what you do is you can demodulate that down, uh, so uh, multiply it by the carrier to bring that, ba bring that back to, to baseband. Uh, you amplify it, and then you low-pass filter it. We'll see why the low-pass filtering in a second. And then uh, you pass that through an analog to digital converter. You get some digital measure of uh, the voltage of this plate. And then hopefully with some simple math, we can uh, find acceleration from this digitized or discretized voltage that, that we are measuring. Um, one thing to note is that in cases where we are working with uh, uh, extremely noisy signals, it would be a good practice to put the amplifier before the down converter, so actually amplify here instead of here. So you amplify your signal first and then down convert it, and then uh, that from a noise point of view, that's actually a better practice. Uh, but mathematically, what is here is uh, perfectly fine, and it actually doesn't matter where you put the amplifier uh, for what we are doing here. In terms of what uh, frequencies for modulation you use, you typically choose a frequency omega c that is much larger than the bandwidth of your, uh, the mechanical bandwidth of your system. So um, a megahertz or a few megahertz are um, some, some common numbers that, that, are, that are used. Okay, so now let's trace the signal uh, through the signal chain and see uh, what, what is going to come out and how it relates to X and ultimately how it relates to acceleration. Okay, so we start with uh, basically this down converted signal, uh, which is uh, just Vx times uh, V0 cosine omega t. So it just becomes V0 squared over 2 times this term 1 plus 2x over d times cosine squared of omega ct. Now, as you know, cosine squared, it, it can be broken down into t two terms. It would, there would be a one half and a cosine of two omega ct over two, right? And this is why we need a low pass filter. So we're going to pass that through an amplifier. That's just a gain factor g. And then what the low pass filter does for us is that it gets rid of the high frequency, like the, the component of the signal that is at two omega c and just gives us the baseband uh, uh, component to work with. And that's exactly what happens here. So uh, Vf of t, that's the signal just before the ADC, is g v0 squared over 4 times 1 plus 2x over d. So this is great, right? Because we have the signal which is directly proportional to uh, the displacement x of t, which is what we want to measure, right? 
Uh, and then we discretize it again, as, as, as uh, we, see, we saw multiple times in the case of the GPS, there is some sampling interval T sub S or some sampling frequency F sub S. Uh, and then we discretize it and we get this expression here. Same as the one above, we just have discretized basically our uh, displacement. Um, so we have X of N instead of X of T. So that's the digitized signal that we're going to get out. The next step is uh, how is that related to uh, acceleration? How do we, so if this is what we get um, out of the ADC, we should be able to do some simple math, some simple DSP, and find acceleration from it, right? And uh, it kind of should be um, obvious from here because what, what we have here, we see that this V is, uh, well, there's some scale factor and other terms, but ultimately it's, it's a linear function of x, right? So I can invert this and write x as a linear function of f, and then we know the transformation from x to acceleration is just a scale factor. You just multiply by the sensitivity, essentially, and then you get your acceleration. So with two linear, like a scale factor and a simple linear transformation, I should be able to find my acceleration from this uh, digitized voltage that we're measuring. And that's exactly how we do. Again, remember when the input is well within the bandwidth of uh, the, the accelerometer, the displacement and the acceleration are linearly related with this sensitivity factor, minus one over omega zero squared. And then as I said, if we invert that previous function which related V and F, X, and write x as a function of v instead. That's just a very simple algebra, right? You just basically take the terms to the other side. Your x of n becomes this linear function of v, d over 2 for v over g v 0 squared minus 1. And then if you multiply this by the sensitivity, we are basically done. Now we have an accelerometer that gives the, accel the digitized or the discretized acceleration um, as a function of this voltage that is measured, which is the output of our uh, ADC. So at this point, we are completely done. We basically have a full system that can measure acceleration in one dimension for now. We see how to extend it to two and three dimensions, but essentially uh, it's, it's a fully functional system at this point. Uh, one thing to note is whenever there is some ADC sampling, our sampling rate should be above Nyquist, of course, and the condition for that is given here. So your uh, T sub S should be less than pi over omega zero. Another way of writing this, which might be more familiar to you, is that your sampling rate, F sub S, should be bigger than twice the largest frequency in the signal, which in our case is two times F0, right? Because F0 is the bandwidth of, of our accelerometer. So um, basically, omega0 is 2 pi F0. That's the angular uh, frequency versus the frequency in hertz. OK, any questions so far? Does this make sense? Yeah. Um, practically, uh, where do you usually put um, like FS? Uh, for F0. Is uh, it like, like, you know, 10 times in order of magnitude below? Or no. Uh, so, okay, so, so the question is, okay, practically, okay, this is mathematically kind of the minimum, right? If it's perfectly band limited, the Nyquist criteria says Fs bigger than 2 F0. Practically, uh, what do we do? We don't do exactly 2. Typically, we also don't do 10. Um, different systems are a diff little different, but something like I've seen 2.5, I've seen 3, I've seen 4. But not 10, because remember, like FS, it's um, when you make your ADCs faster and faster, they become more power hungry and more expensive to make. So there is there's uh, other system design trade-offs. But yeah, it also depends on how how. Um, so we said the system is like a low-pass filter, but how sharp that drop uh, or the after the uh, omega zero, how how sharp your uh, basically drop off is uh, systems that are not very sharp like if it was a first order system you might want to increase your uh, sampling rate a little more to get less aliasing basically um, okay so so this was uh, we so far talked about one architecture for uh, an accelerometer there is another type of architecture which is um, from mechanical and electrical point of view more complex uh, but it has uh, some, some very distinct benefits to it, and, and it's sometimes used, okay? And that's an actively controlled accelerometer. So the way the actively controlled uh, accelerometer works, um, that? 
uh, the way the actively controlled accelerometer works is that uh, this part is exactly the same as what we talked about. So you have your capacitive sensor, you get a signal proportional to the displacement of the moving plate, and then we amplify it, we low pass filter it, we digitize it. But then what we do, instead of working with this VF directly, we actually put that in a feedback loop. And what the feedback loop does is that from this measured voltage, it extracts an error signal and feeds that error signal to a electrostatic actuator. And what the electrostatic actuator does is that it can apply uh, through the electrostatic mechanism a force to that moving plate, which is tied to our proof mass. And this force through this error signal is adjusted such that the proof mass does, almost doesn't move at all. So it almost just keeps it stationary. As soon as it wants to move, your, error, your feedback error signal generates a force and it just keeps it in position, right? It, it doesn't let it move much. So it's almost always at zero. Uh, our, our mass is, uh, is at rest. And the way this works, for if, if the mass is not moving at all, that means the net force applying on it should be zero, which means this electrostatic force, FAC, should exactly uh, cancel out the inertial force, right? So we should have FAC is minus F inertial. And remember, minus F inertial is just the mass, uh, the proof mass uh, times its uh, acceleration, XT double dot, which is minus M times X double dot plus XP double dot. And then if this system works perfectly, if the proof mass is always almost stationary, that means X double dot should be zero. Right? Because if it's not zero, that means the proof mass is internal to the enclosure. It is accelerating. So in a, in a perfect case, this term is zero. That means your F acceleration is just minus M XB double dot. And remember, XB double dot is the external acceleration to the enclosure that we want to measure. So in this case, you get this very simple linear relationship between the force your actuator is generating and the external acceleration. Uh, so you simply calculate a external by scaling your uh, electrostatic actuator's force by minus one over m. Okay. Now note that to do this, we have added a lot of complexity in hardware, in electronics, and in the mechanical design. Uh, you need this force force balance controller. You need an electrostatic actuator, and you actually need to mechanically build the actuation mechanism. But you get uh, uh, a number of very good benefits. One is that uh, in uh, actively controlled accelerometers, they are more linear. They have a much uh, more linear response. And the reason for that is that specifically when we talked about the spring in this uh, damped oscillator, we assumed a linear model for it, right? We assumed that the force of the spring is just the constant times its, its displacement. That assumption, which is Hooke's law, it's uh, accurate when the displacement is not very large. But as you start displacing more and more, the behavior of the spring becomes nonlinear, which means our underlying physics assumption on which we derived all these equations it starts to become a little more inaccurate and eventually break down. Uh, but in the actively controlled system, because you, you never displace the mass too much, your linearity assumption is, is always valid. So that uh, that really helps, and these systems are uh, much more linear. They're also much faster. Why they're faster? Again, because the proof mass doesn't move much or at all, uh, you don't need to wait for the transients to die and get to the steady state, which you can then use to find your acceleration. You are almost always, by definition, at steady state. You basically keep your mass at steady state. So these systems, actively controlled systems, can have much faster responses which also means they have much, uh, much more bandwidth. And uh, again, this idea of getting more bandwidth with a feedback loop should be familiar if you have studied electrical systems. As you know, by generating feedback loops, you can uh, get more bandwidth out of, out of systems. Finally, they are more robust against fabrication process variations. Uh, specifically, for instance, as you fabricate these things, as uh, we'll talk about next time, uh, there could be variations in the, the, the uh, uh, spring constant, K. And K 
is baked into the sensitivity, remember, right, that omega zero is root uh, k over m, which is the sensitivity of the uh, not actively controlled system. And uh, when there's process variations, you can't per system measure your k, so you just assume some nominal value for your sensitivity. And then due to process variations, uh, your system can become more inaccurate. And the actively controlled systems don't have that. Why? Because this is the equation. Your external is just f over m, so it only depends on the proof mass and not, not on k. It also doesn't depend, for instance, on the spacing between the two uh, uh, plates of the uh, uh, capacitive sensor. So it has a number of very good benefits, but the trade-off is it's a more complex system, needs more complex hardware, more complex mechanics, more complex uh, control loops, and so on and so forth. So both these types of systems, the, the regular one that we talked about and the actively controlled, are built and are used uh, extensively, uh, it's according to your application that you need to decide, do you really need an actively controlled one, which is going to be more expensive and uh, maybe a little more power uh, consuming, or is a regular one good enough? Okay, I think this is a good spot uh, uh, to quit for today, and then next time we'll continue. Uh, any questions? All right, see you next time. <laughs>